us a Bible study on tonight. We pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. Our church has joined in with other churches in the United States, and we are reading a 21 day devotional book that's entitled Fix My Prayer Life, written by Pastor R. Timothy Jones, among other pastors. And on yesterday, the devotional was Matthew 6 and 11. And it says, give us this day our daily bread. And Pastor Claude White, Pastor Claude White, he wrote this devotional. And he says, this petition teaches us what it means to rely on and trust God. When we trust God for our daily bread, we will live our lives without worry and self-pity. He goes on to say that Jesus teaches us to pray for daily bread. And this reminds us that we can depend on God responding. We have no need to wonder if God is available. We just need to trust the Lord is there for us. And just as God takes care of us today, we can depend on him to take care of us tomorrow. He says the days change, but God does not. New day, same God. And this lets me know that if I want peace of mind in this dark and chaotic world, that I have got to trust God in everything. And our song tonight is, I Will Trust in the Lord. And I pray that you help us sing this song. Bye. 
Father God in heaven, it's in Jesus' name we come. We thank you, Lord, for another privilege to trust you. We thank you for another honor, another great opportunity. God, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come once again to study your word. Lord, we glorify you. We magnify you. Lord, we lift you for you are the only worthy and only true God. God, you are God by yourself. We come to say we love you. We come to adore you. We come to magnify your name. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Don't let our sins hold us away from your word. Bless your word, Father God, that your word will go forth. That men, women, boys, and girls will fall out with their sins. And that they will leave their evil ways. Now, Father God, we ask you to bless us, Father God, as we come now to hear your word. Speak to us, Lord, and bless us to trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. today. Amen. We need everybody to trust him. We need everybody to trust in the Lord until we die. Man asked the question the other day, do I need Jesus? Do I need Jesus to go to heaven? The lady said to him, brother, you need Jesus to go to Walmart. <laughs> you need Jesus to pump gas. <laughs> You need Jesus to go to the mailbox. <laughs> Everybody needs Jesus. Amen. We need Jesus just to do whatever we usually do. We need Jesus. We need Jesus to Christ to do whatever we do. We need Jesus. And uh, this day and time, we need him to go around the corner, <laughs> to step out the door. <laughs> we need Jesus to Christ. If, you, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna remain in your house, you need Jesus. So we come tonight to lift up the words that were spoken and written on behalf of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6. We're going to close this chapter out tonight, Matthew chapter 6. We're looking at verses 31 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. We have identified Jesus' model prayer, right? It's not Jesus... Jesus' prayer is Jesus' model prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer. It is Jesus' model prayer. What do we mean when we say it's his model prayer? What does that mean? It's Jesus' model prayer. It's an example. It's an example by which we can follow, right? We begin by honoring and glorifying God. We need to make sure that we give God the glory and don't take his glory. Amen. When you look at when you look at Acts chapter twelve, right around verse twenty-one, you will find that Herod stood on a great day, gave a great speech. He blew the people away. He was such an awesome speech until the people said, "This is the voice of a God." And the Bible says he did not give God the glory, so the worms ate up his body, and he gave up the ghost. So the first thing we do in prayer is give God the glory. Amen? Amen. We honor him. We glorify him. We speak well of him. The word eulogize, we use it all the time where? In what setting? In funerals, right? Mm -hmm. When you think of the word eulogize, what are, you, what are we saying? This, this preacher is going to eulogize him. What are we saying? You, the word eulogize means to speak well of, right? So in some settings, you will have a eulogist, and then you will have the preacher. So you don't have to be a preacher to speak well of people, right? So when you eulogize people, you are speaking well of them. Kind of like Sister Davis does to me all the time. Every time she speaks of me, she's eulogizing me. Except about 2% of the time. Amen. Bless the name of Jesus. 
So we want to always speak well of God. And when we speak well of God, we speak to God. We speak to God. One of the writers, one of the writers in the book, one of the authors in the book, Fix My Prayer Life, he says that he reminded us in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit is making intercessions for us. When you get to a point where you don't know what to pray, when you don't know how to pray, or when you get to a point where you just can't pray, if you got the right connection with God, the Holy Spirit maketh intercessions for you with moaning and groaning that we can't even interpret. Isn't that something? And one of the writers in Fix My Prayer Life says, when the Holy Spirit does this, it means that God is talking to God. Woo! God is talking to God. So you ought to be, you ought to have a prayer life where you're always talking to God. So when you get to a point where you can't pray, then the Holy Spirit can pray for you. And it's an awesome thing when God talks to God. How many of you talk to yourself? Come on, tell the truth and say it together. What do they say you do when you talk to yourself? What do they say about your state of mind when you talk to yourself? Oh, is that what they say? <laughs> my, my, my. So when you, I've never heard that one. They didn't say that in the country. But when, when you're talking to yourself, you're talking to a very intelligent person. I like that. Anybody else? What do people say when they say when you talk to yourself? What, you're crazy, right? But when you look at the book of Psalms, oftentimes the psalmists are talking to themselves. When you look at Psalm 103 and Psalm 107, the author tells himself, he says, soul, come on, let's worship the Lord. The word soul is translated your very own self, one very own self. So the author is talking to himself. And let me tell you something. If you're spiritual, you better talk to yourself. If you want to walk with Jesus, you better talk to yourself. So the good thing about it is when the Holy Spirit prays and intercedes for us, God is talking to God. That was awesome. That was, that was mind-boggling to me. When God talks to God, you know that God has something to say to God. Because God, God wants us to, to tell him what he said in his word. In our prayers, we want to tell God what God has already said to us. So you ought to pray God's word. You ought to pray God's words. What do I mean when I say you ought to pray God's words? Sister Derek, what do I mean when I say you ought to pray God's words? We have to uh, pray God's words, pray God's words to set the good news. Right, so you you telling God what God has said. So what do I mean when I say you ought to pray over God's words? Okay, so so before you start reading, while you are reading, uh, when you start thinking about reading, you want to say, God, teach me your word. Lord, bless your word to come off the pages into my heart. So you ought to pray God's word. You ought to tell God what God has said. And you ought to pray over God's word, meaning that you ought to, you ought to tell God, God, I need your help here. Because remember now, the Bible that we read, none of them were written, written 2,000 years ago, right? So there must be some interpretation. And because we got several different versions, we know that there are some misinterpretations, right? Yes. We got over 3,000 denominations in, in, in the U.S. of A, and this was years ago, it's probably a bunch of more now. Um, there are over 2,000, 3,000 a denomination, so somebody misinterpreted, right? Because the Church of Christ will tell you tonight, they are the Church of Christ. And you got to do it our way, the way we do it. You got to sound like us. You got to do it like us. Or you are not with the Lord. Are you with me? So we have to make sure that God speaks to us through His Word. That's what prayer is all about. Prayer, as Sister Wood said last week, is that prayer is a communication that is a dialogue. It is God talking to us and us talking to God. God talking to us and we talking to God. 
The problem is many times when we pray, we spend more time talking to God and then shut the door when God gets ready to talk. God says, go into your closet and shut the door and talk to me. But what we do is we go into the closet, shut the door, come out of the closet and go back and slam the door on God. God trying to say something, we, we gone. God trying to flag us down, I got something to say to you. And we out of here. And we treat God like we're giving him a grocery list. And, and then, then we treat God, God, I forgot to say this in prayer, so let me text it to you. <laughs> so we don't have time to worry about and think about and give God time to speak to us. But we want to make sure that we are in line with what God is doing, right? So let's look at um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. When you see this, you, you have to understand Jesus, Jesus is doing one of those real long sermons. Jesus preaches from chapter 5 to chapter 6 to chapter 7. Boy, if Jesus preached at this church, will you stay away? <laughs> Jesus preached a long time this day. We know it as the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus just talking. I mean, he stopped a minute, then he talked some more. Somebody said something, he talked some more. Boy, you think my little 20, 40 minutes is a long time. Jesus just kept right on talking. Jesus Jesus started in chapter 5, ended up in chapter 7. So we're about midway here. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let me tell you a secret. Today got enough trouble for you to be worried about tomorrow. <laughs> I just want to tell you, on my way to the rapture, I just want to let you know, today you got enough trouble. If you don't believe me, 13, 11, 2, 26, 39, 51, 55, 420, 410, they got enough trouble. I mean, children are dying in groves yes, right. over senseless stuff. We having children funerals just like we having 90 year old men funerals. Mm -hmm. Children are laying in their bed. And you know, we like to say those children should have been in the right place. They are laying in their beds and getting shot and killed. Mm -hmm. They're riding their parents' car and getting dead. Just a few weeks ago, I guess it's been maybe a month now, we left here on a Wednesday night. And as we do, two men are going out the gate. One guy parks and wait on the other guy to shut the door. We do do that, right, Brother Yeah. Okay. One guy waits on the other guy to shut the gate, and then we both drive off at the same time. This particular night, Deacon Alfred and I waited on each other. He shut the gate. I drove off first, and while he was sitting there, a car came around him speeding, and ran, ran the stop sign at the end of the street, hit another car going down color, smashed the car on the other side of the road, and later a little girl died. It's happening day after day after day after day. If we ever needed to pray, we need to pray right now. We need prayer right now. We need prayer. I mean, we need to be teaching our children how to pray. We need to teach them. When I when I look at broadcasts, I see more people tip talking, showing children how to do a dance, but none of them showing them how to play. Right. Right. Every now and then, you will find somebody riding in the car, singing with their child, singing a spiritual song, or teaching the child how to pray, 
or a child had, can recite scripture or recite, recite a prayer. Every now and then. Every now and then. But when things happen, everybody's all torn up. Mm -hmm. And we ought to be. But most of all, and when we'll find it in the text in verse 33, we need to ask God to break our hearts for what breaks God's heart. We need, in our prayer time, we need to ask God, break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks your heart. Why we need to ask that question? Why we need to make that request? Why we need to tell God that? Anybody? Why, why do we want God to break our heart? Because when you use the word breaking your heart or broken heart, it's usually terrible, right? But in this sense, our hearts need to be broken for what God's heart is broken. Because God's heart is broken when lost souls are not saved. God's heart is broken when young people are dying like they are in senseless acts. 22 shots in one little girl's body. My Lord. It ought to break your heart. It ought to damage you greatly. But we got to get to a point where our hearts are broken just like God's heart is broken. I could feel, I could feel President Obama's pain, I think it was Sandy Hook, all these children got shot and killed on his watch. And he could not make it through the interview, could not make it through his speech without breaking down. His heart was so broken, all these children dead to me right. Trayvon Martin. On his watch, he says, he says, when I look at Trayvon Martin, I see myself. In other words, it could have been me. But we have gotten immune to it. Just another person, another act, day by day. We need prayer. We, we need prayer. So, so, so Jesus, Jesus talks and he talks about us hating the things of the world. He talks about the light of the body. He talks about laying up for yourself treasures on earth and not treasures in heaven. When we ought to be laying up treasures in heaven instead of not laying up treasures on earth. He says, you need to lay up treasures in heaven where there's no rust that can contaminate it. Where there's no moth that can eat it. Where it is eternal and not temporal. We ought to drive cars. We ought to, ought to take care of our houses. We, we ought to like our, our furniture in our apartments. But don't let our stuff supersede what we do for God. Amen. And how our hearts are turned toward him. Too many people have put, have put their livelihoods, their hopes, their dreams in their stuff. It just blesses me so when I see a house just born, burned down or a hurricane has, has torn it down. No, it doesn't bless me to see that action, but it blesses me to see the resident says, God has spared our lives. God has blessed us again. We'll have to start all over. We have nothing. We don't know where we're going to live, what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, where we're going to be in the morning. But God has spared us. Right. Thank you, Lord. And that's one in a million. Usually you see people just falling out, cussing, and, and acting crazy because something has happened. But when you get to a point where you put God first, you will get to a point where you love what God does, even in your challenges that's right. and in your trouble. That's right. you, can, you, can, you can get a number. You, you, can get, you can get another one. It's, I mean, there are more where those came from. Let me tell you, if you got one, and it doesn't ta take long, see, when you go through a tragedy and God honors your faith 
It doesn't take as long to get the new one as, you, as it took to get that one. Because God gives favor. He gives favor. He gives favor over and over again. He just wants you to trust him. So Jesus says, don't put your hope in these things. And he goes on to talk about the eye is the is light to the body. He talks about the fact that you, what's in your, your body is what your eye is, is looking for. What he's saying is that the light of, of you, the light of what you see in one version classified as the lamp, this lamp is what you see. He's talking about what's in your mind. Your mind ought to be focused on those things that are spiritual more than those things that are physical. It's the Bible. It goes on to talk about men cannot serve two masters. Men cannot serve two masters. Then he says man cannot serve God and mammon. So what he's saying to us, we can't even serve God and money. Before I'm taken wrong, I didn't say you don't need any money, because I'm going to tell you something. You need money. The Bible says money answers all things. And God doesn't have a problem with you having money. God is all right with it. He wants you to have a lot of money. But it's your motives. It's your movement. It's what your response is to money. God wants you concerned about his kingdom. God wants you more concerned about the things that you can't see than the things that you can't see. Isn't that something? You can have a house full of money, a bank full of money, your 401k, 403b, all can be doing well, but if you don't have your health and strength, money can't pay for it. Now, money answers all things, but when you don't have health, you can have all the money in the world. You can pay for the greatest doctors in the world. If your doctor is not Jesus, or if Jesus says no, the money might as well go. Jesus calls our attention to this, and then he goes on to talk about the birds of the air, the fowls of the air. He talks about the fact that, that we don't have to worry about all these things because there's enough trouble in every day for itself. How many of you know there's enough trouble every day? Every day. Every, every day comes with trouble. He goes on to say, verse 25, he says, do not worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. And we're on fast right now, so guess what? We shouldn't be worried about what we're going to drink or what we're going to eat anyway. But every time I open that refrigerator door, that kind of dry ginger ale that's been sitting there for a month looks really good. I mean, it's the gold label. Canada's dry, ginger ale. Then I went to the garage and opened up the deep freezer. You know, back home, we call it deep freezer. I don't know what y'all call it here. We, I open up the deep freezer because it freezes deep. And the moment I open up and look in there, I see uh, drumsticks. I'm not talking about chicken drumsticks. I'm talking about ice cream drumsticks with caramel in the middle. With nuts sprinkled on the top of it. And guess what I do? I, I shut it down. Just, just lead me not into temptation. Because the devil, and you know that ain't nothing but the devil. There's nothing but the devil. The devil will always show you what you want. God gives us what we need. He says, don't worry about what to eat. Don't worry about what to drink. Don't worry about your body or what to put on. Don't worry about if you got enough food. Your life is more than food. Your body is more than clothing. Then he draws a parallel to the birds of the air. Says, they, just, they don't have a worry in the world. They don't worry about much of anything. They just get up in the morning, fly, get back down, 
They can even get on the electric wire and just sit there. Don't you try that. Don't even, don't even dream of it. You, you don't even want the statistic or be the statistic. So birds don't even worry about anything. They can sit on their wire all day long with electricity running through it. They don't have to worry about. They don't have to worry about food. They don't. They don't soar, but they do reap. Yeah. And it's all because of God. He draws this parallel to remind us that God is the one who feeds these birds. Then he asks the question: Can you add just one cubit to your stature? No, you can't. So why worry about it? The lilies of the field, they just grow. Check this out. Lilies become plentiful around the resurrection season. Have you ever wondered why? God got this ecosystem all set up. Have you, have you noticed that dogwood trees show up? I mean, just out of nowhere blooming during the resurrection season? Because the old story goes that he was hung on a dogwood tree. But if you notice, that tree limb is not big enough to hang a man on it. Because after Jesus, now this is, this is a legend now. Because after Jesus was hung on it, God decided to never make a dogwood tree big enough to hang another man on it. But just, just drive through. The tree just got beautiful limbs on it, beautiful leaves on it. But then when it gets to late March, early April, or and then it shifts when, when the season shifts, when resurrection season shifts, just watch it. They begin to bloom and to blossom and look all yellow and white and beautiful. God got this thing worked out. I'm telling you, God has it worked out. Check this out. The rain comes, the rain falls, waters the grass, water the trees, the trees and the grass soak it up. The sun comes out and it, and, and it, it evaporates and guess where it goes? Right back up. Sits in the clouds and there's another rain. The problem with Houston, the problem with Texas is that we have too much cement. Not enough trees, not enough vegetation. So when the rain falls, it just floats and floats and keeps floating up in houses. In ditches, we can't dig enough of them. Reservoirs, we can't make enough of them. Because God's ego system has the best plan. Sun comes out, evaporation takes place, it goes back up and sits in the sky until God says, come back again. Your, your plants, your plants are best watered with rainwater. Big Mama and them had it right. They had a big old tub. I mean, it was literally three feet high and about six feet long. And it was sitting right up under the house, right, right next to the house. So when the water comes off the house, all that didn't fall in the tub is fairly drained off the house. And they used that water to water vegetables and plants. Because guess what? It's the best water. And here we are, spending money on stuff I never thought I'd spend money on. We paying for water. We're standing in line to pay for water. Another thing I thought I'd never have to see, see a day that we would buy. Chips of wood so we can beautify our, our places. They call it mulch in the state. We're paying for wood that was so plentiful and was readily available. Guess another thing we pay for that I never thought I'd pay for. Dirt. Now, we paying somebody else for dirt that God put on earth. But now, you know something wrong with that picture. So, it's brown something wrong with that. We paying for dirt. We paying, we paying for water. We paying, we paying for wood. And now they have got sophisticated with it. They got the affluent water. It's causing people to live a lot longer. Because it's pH balancing your intestines and, and it's pH balancing your system. Now that's an extra five, six dollar a bottle there. 
Then they got a bottle of water with a label on it. It's a, it's a clear bottle with a green label on it. You pay a lot of money for that bottle. And the, and the bottle is shaped real nice and neat. God has a system that really works. I mean, Mr. Trump got into it with, at that time, a nine-year-old little girl. When everybody can see that we're suffering from exorbitant temperatures. But there's no heat wave. There's no nothing to worry about. And this little girl is producing her science project. And, she, she's, and, and, and he cut her down. God has a system that works. Jesus says, don't worry about this stuff. He says, the lilies just grow and they don't toil, they don't spin. And yet, I say to you, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed any better than these lilies of the field. That is again, money doesn't matter. Solomon was rich. I mean, filthy rich. Even richer than the Texan quarterback that's sitting on the shelf. <laughs> Solomon was filthy rich. And you know Texan quarterback that's sitting on the shelf is filthy rich. Yes, I mean, the richest game for game and year for year. But that doesn't matter when it compares to God. Solomon had all this money. Solomon had all this knowledge. But none of that matter. When God steps in, the lilies look better than Solomon. He goes on to talk about tomorrow. Don't, don't, don't worry about how, how tomorrow is going to make a difference. Verse 30 says, But if God so clothed the grass, now look at here, he's going from the lily to the grass. If God so clothed the grass, if God takes care of the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven and burnt up, the grass of the field, God takes care of that. Throw it up. Will he not much more clothe you? O ye a little faith, he said, as we pray, as we get along with God, we ought to walk in faith. We remember the old statement, uh, prayer is the key, faith unlocks the door. It's still real. The senior saint back home just made so much sense, but it took me 58 years to figure it out. They, they just made so much sense. I mean, they just said stuff like birds of a fellow flock together. If you lay down with dogs, you get up and sleep. You better stay with the Lord. The Lord will keep you. Watch out who you hang with. 58 years, and now I finally figured out. All of us ought to go back to our parents and apologize. All of us, we ought to just, I, I apologize. Will you please forgive me? Daddy said, Mama said, no, you can't go. See, in some households, they would go ask Mama. She would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then they'd go ask Daddy. Daddy would say, no. And then they'd say, well, Mama said I can go. <laughs> that didn't happen in my house. <laughs> we would have to have a family meeting with everybody. If one person needed to go, the whole grove of children had to come in and sit down and hear the reason why I couldn't go. You see what I'm saying? But now, we, we don't even have lunch together. We don't even have dinner together. God has a system. The system is broken. But if we go back to what God has said and do it God's way and walk in faith with God, then God will bless us. Look at what it says, verse 31. Therefore, do not worry. It says, therefore, do not worry. You see, the problem is when you look at Money, food, clothing, and shelter, and don't trust God enough to make these things happen for you, then you're devaluing what God has put in place. 
you are devaluing what God has already laid out. And it cheapens the riches of God. You have just cheapened the riches of God. I listen to people all the time. I just shake my head. How old are you? You know a woman didn't tell her age. <laughs> Baby, you better be glad. And then you got some people that say, how old are you? Now they're 55 and they say, oh, I'm 25. Mm -hmm. So you stopped living 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 10 years ago. You just stopped living. You better give God the glory mm -hmm. for where he has brought you. How far he has brought you? Yeah, I, I, I'm so happy. I am 58 58.75 years old. I can't wait to April 15 get here. Some of y'all running from April the 15. I can't wait to April the 15 get here. April the 15, God will spare me to be on the earth for 59 years. April the 15. I'm glad about it. People walk around here talking, oh, I ain't, I ain't gonna ever get old. Oh, yeah, you're gonna get something. If you don't get old, you're gonna leave here. So don't cheapen the gift. The blessings of your age, the blessings of your health, don't cheapen it. Don't devalue it. And I know it's natural to have worries and anxieties. But we're living a supernatural life because we're with Christ, right? We're saved. We are different. We, we, are, we are the creme de la creme. Or some people would say the creme de la creme. We really got it going on. We're living here in the physical, but we're already over yonder in the spiritual. Are you with me? We're over yonder. We already. The, the, some, at, at, at some funerals when we're marching out, they say, I'm going up yonder. But let me tell you a secret. When you breathe your last breath down here, you better hope you're already going up yonder. There's no purgatory where you're going to sit and then the saints will pray you on into heaven. The, the statement has been made that, that you have to pay for your prayers that go up into heaven. Said John F. Kennedy, they know he's in heaven because, because he had a lot of money and the saints prayed based on that money. Let me just share something with you. It, it takes a commitment to Jesus the Christ. It takes accepting his death, burial, and resurrection. It takes you trusting him as your personal savior. That's the only way you get in heaven. All right. Your money will be dying here when somebody else will waste it. There's no sense in you getting upset when you leave your, your children cars, houses, and land. Because when we were growing up, we, we valued those things. If our parents would leave something to us, we'd try to keep it in the family. You let somebody offer your child $20,000, it's gone. There's no, no reason to get upset about it. That's, that's what this generation does. They see right now. And some of them will use this scripture. Well, the Bible said, don't think about tomorrow. I'm living it all for the day. But the Bible also says, consider the cost. Don't start a building, number one, without a foundation. And don't start a building without being able to finish it. So he says, don't consider what you're wearing. Verse 30, 32 says, But after all, the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles. So after all these things, the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles seek these things. Those who are Gentiles are heathens to the Jews. They are unbelievers. They are ungodly. Jesus says, These are the things that the heathens seek. These are the things that the ungodly seek. These are the things that the people who are not saved and not does not know the Lord, that do not know the Lord, these are the things that they see. And they value them above all other things. If you got filled to this today, would you change anything? Will you stop coming to church? No, 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 no. 
Okay, I, I hear you, but I've seen it. I, I've seen it. Sister David, I've seen it. I've seen when people start making money, they don't get enough, they keep going on, and they sign up for Sundays. They sign up for Wednesdays. The pre is more important to them than their worship. Y'all know what pre is? Right? So the pre the, 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 the pre-dem is what you get paid extra for that. If you're on night shift, I mean, if, 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 if you're on night shift, you got to sleep during the day, so, but I work two or three extra nights so I can get that pre paid. payment. And don't mention holidays when you could spend time with your church, spend, you could spend time with your family. I work these holidays so I get double pay. Jesus says, put God first. We got a guy around the street that does a t-shirt uh, printing. Um, Brother, Hatton, Brother Hatton has a slogan that he put on his t-shirt. And the slogan says, put God first and he will put you first. Put God first. He will put you first. When we went to Brazil, we had on our t-shirt, God first. When we got to Brazil, when they read God first, we also had it printed in, in Portuguese. The, the, word God, the words God first in English means God in first place in Portuguese. If you put God first, if you put God in first place, let me tell you, God will keep you in first place. No, I didn't say you're going to have everything you want. But I said, put God in first place. Put God first. Do what God will have you to do. And God will, if you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. I, I guarantee you. Because let me tell you, when your body is racking in pain, and the doctor comes to you, rolls his silverware up in his napkin, walks out with his mask on, drops his mask and say, take him home, I can't do anything else for them, your money and your stuff won't make a difference. That's right. And we have to teach our children this. Don't wait until they fall victims to tell them. Tell them now. We have to tell our children what they don't want to hear. If you want, if you want a benefit later, you got to do the sacrifice today. Think of the last round that says, be willing to do today what no one else will do in order to have tomorrow what no one else will have. Be willing to do today what no one else will do in order to have tomorrow what no one else will have. Put God first. He says, don't be like the heathen, don't be like the Gentiles. For your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. So the things that Jesus has just outlined is not something you just want. This is a necessity. This is a need. All these things that he says, don't put a lot of stock in. We actually need these things. So he doesn't have a problem with you having it. God knows what you need. It becomes a sad day when you have to play, pray, God, give me some clothes to wear. God knows what you need. Yes, you ought to pray about it, but see, we're not praying, God, give me clothes to wear. We're praying, God, which one I'm going to wear. Are you with me? There's not a person under my voice, and if it is, call me, let me know. That, that really, really, really have to go find clothes to wear. Anybody in the room? That you just got to go find just one stitch to put on. There are people who have been burned out of their houses that, that things have been blown away. There, there are people in this city, in this state that have come to their aid and come to their rescue. Because God knows what you need. God knows 
He has put all these things together. That's why I don't understand people standing on the side of Rome with a sign saying, please help. You got all of these social entities that are helping people. Churches, social services that are helping people. But some of them will tell you, I ain't going to do what they, they do. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. Work out a budget. I ain't doing that. But it's only because they don't want what they need. They want what they want. You know what I've discovered, Sister Wood? People pay for what they want. And they beg for what they need. They pay for what they want. And then they get you all in a bind. You crying and snaking and slinging and snot and feel sorry for them. Because they're going to come to you for what they need. But they already have paid for what they want. What it looked like me coming to the church, asking the church to buy me a brand new car because now if you choose to do it, that's you and God. <laughs> but I do have something that gets me from point A to point B. Right. Are you with me? And if the church does it, bless the Lord, bless the church, bless the man of God, because you ought to take care of the man of God. But it's take care of, is there, is there ever enough? Is, is, does it ever get to enough? Does, does it ever, do I ever, see, when, when you talk about, when you talk about people wanting more than what they have and what they need, it becomes covetousness. And, and don't mention people getting things because other folk got it. I don't know where the name came from, but they try to keep up with Jones. He says, in verse, verse 30, 33, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, God's rule on planet earth is what we need. Jesus says, when you pray, begin by saying, hallowed to your name, we glorify your name, Lord. And then he talks about let your kingdom come. God wants his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We ought to want God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Wherever there's a kingdom, there ought to be a king. If you are saved, if you're born again, you have a king. You're walking in God's kingdom. The king is Jesus. Not only is he the king, he is the conquering king of Calvary. Not only is he the king, he is the king of kings. His name is Jesus. Right about here back home, the preacher would say, his name is Jesus. The righteous son of God. So he says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God's rule in your life. And his righteousness. He says, seek first God's rule, the kingdom. And then he said, his righteousness, live right before the people. He says, seek God's kingdom. Allow God to rule over you. And after you allow God to rule over you, then in the process of allowing him to rule over you, and after he rules over you, then you can have righteous living. He says, seek after that first. When you pray, you ought to be praying, Lord, fix my heart. This is doing this prayer and this fasting. This is the time you tell God, God, take this away from me. God, I, I don't want this in my life. This is a time where generational curses can be broken. This is a time when life can be changed. This is a time where you don't, those things you've been trying to get rid of, this is the time to pray, Lord, get rid of this. I, you have to get to a point in your life where you don't like you. That's right, sir. I know you don't like other people. But, like but I'm talking about you ought to get to a point in your life where your attitude, your attitude stinks to you. Your mindset is jacked up to you. This is the time to seek God, His righteousness, and then these things will be added. 
You see, oftentimes people can't get what God wants them to have because they're trying to hold on to what they already have. There are monkeys that are being caught because they won't let go of what they already have. And there are people being caught because they won't let go of what they already have. What they would do to catch monkeys is they would take a coconut and they would carve enough coconut out where the monkey can get his hand into the coconut. So he would get his hand in the coconut, and by the time he'd get ready to run away, his coconut is sitting in the trap. And all he has to do is let the coconut go. But he got his hand in there now, he got a hold of that coconut, he's not going to let it go. All he has to do is let the coconut go and pull his hand out the same way he put his hand in. The problem with saints of God is that we won't let the coconut go. That's right. Yes, Lord. And women, I'm gonna tell you, y'all got a no good one now raft. And you won't let him go so God can bring Boaz there. You just gotta let him go. Just gotta, gotta let him go. You gotta turn it loose. You gotta turn it loose. You got stuff you've been dealing with all your life. And you won't let that stuff go. And you and, and he or she have concluded you love the misery of it all. You just like that monk. He put his hand in the in the cage, reach and grab the coconut, and they got the coconut, they got the coconut cut just a little bit for him to put his hand in. So he get his hand in there, then he grabbed that coconut and he, he's he's about to bag out by the time he starts bagging out the cage shut down. But if you turn the coconut, he can pull his hand right on out. You got to let some stuff go. Jesus says, turn it loose, give it to the Lord, put him first, live for the Lord, let God rule over your life, and when you let God rule over your life, guess what? You can have a prosperous life. Seek the kingdom of God. And he says, don't seek him by default. Fix My Life prayer book, one of the authors says, don't make God a last resort. Make him your first stop. Somebody making God your last result, and, and you've been in this same place for years and years. Let me tell you, Elijah, the brook has dried up. It's time for you to move on. When the brook is dry, God ain't speaking there anymore. When the brook is dry, the ravens have stopped coming. It's time to move on. Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and all these things you're trying to hold on to, God will give them to you. Verse 34, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow got some junk that, they gonna, that tomorrow going to throw at us. You think you got hit today? Tomorrow got some more stuff to throw at you. And not, not only, you may have gotten past today. You see these name and claim and preachers and prosperity preachers ain't going to tell you this, okay? But, but you can get ready and get fixed to relax. And you can get to a point where you think you got it conquered. And bam, something else shows up. One day I was standing in the ocean and I was just standing there. And I'm, I'm testing the waves. And I noticed that one wave hit me and it shakes me. Another wave hit me and shakes me even more. I noticed that every wave got bigger and bigger. And when that wave got bigger and bigger, it finally knocked me down. You can get knocked down. But Paul says we ain't crushed. We still have God. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can. You stay with him because he's a winner. How many of y'all like hanging out with losers? Anybody like the devil is a loser. He may make he may he may make it look like now you you're thirteen to thirty one in his favor. The fact that the matter is he's gonna lose. You just in the second quarter you giving up. Trust God. God God is a winner. Sufficient for the day is his own trouble. <laughs> when you got trouble, 
It'll take care of itself. And you don't have to go looking for any trouble. He says, seek God first. God's kingdom. Seek God first. And as you seek God first, his kingdom and his righteousness make us whole. Amen? Amen? Amen. Questions or comments? Amen. Questions or comments? Anybody? Brother Miles, you ought to have some questions. You want me to have some on Sunday, so you better, you better have one tonight. <laughs> questions or comments? Anybody? Sister Davis? You don't have anything? My, 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 Jesus. Maybe I need to stand at home and, and teach this message. <laughs> the door of the church is open. If you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. You can trust him tonight. Jesus Christ died on a skull hill called Calvary. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. In order for you to be a part of his kingdom, you must receive Jesus the Christ. You must trust him. Believe that he died on a skull hill called Calvary. That he was laid in a barber tomb. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. John chapter 3, verse 16. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8 declares, if you can believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, buried in a borrowed tomb, rose from the dead, you can be saved right now, right here. If this is you, bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life. This is the only way you can get to heaven. It's through Jesus. Repeat after me. Say these words. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. During our prayer time, we want to pray for Chastity Rabbit. I think she's one years old. She's suffering off and on with sickle cell anemia. We want to pray for her. We want to lift her before the Lord. As well as all of those that have been on our prayer list for the last week or so, we want to lift them in prayer. Yes, God. We want to pray for those who are bereaved, those who are sick, those who are going through trouble and troubled times. So during your prayer time, during your fasting time, during your reading time, during your dialogue with the Lord, Let's lift up this young girl. Her grandmother is a distant global member of our church. And see, we want, we want to lift this young lady, this young girl before the Lord, as well as all the others that we have called out and called names. And it's now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for this study. We thank you, Father, for blessing us. We ask you to bless us to seek you first. Now, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us as we come to give unto you. We ask you to bless every giver. Bless our distant givers. Bless our local givers. And Lord, we ask you to bless our hearts to be turned toward you that we will seek you first. We thank you for who you are, for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank you. Before we come to give to the Lord, if you are giving electronically, you can give to our Zelle account. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. 
You want to mail in your tithes, your offering, your sacrificial gifts, or your donations to the New Beginning Church. You can do so by mailing it to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Please come and visit with us on Wednesday nights at 715, right here at the New Beginning Church. Where you can come to our Sunday school class at 9 a.m. on Sundays. You can come to our worship service at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays. We're located at 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas. 4251 Shiramai. Shiramai is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas. 77048. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Father God, we thank you for this night. We thank you for who, who you are. We thank you, Father God, for little chastity. We pray that you heal her, bless her, and keep her. Lord, we ask you to amaze the doctors. Bless them to see you in action. We know you as a healer. We know you as a strengthener. We know you, Father God, as one who makes no mistakes. We ask you to bless her now and keep her. We ask you, Father God, to heal her body, that she will stand and testify of your goodness and who you are as God. Not unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us do it by saying, Amen. Amen. We're uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are leading, reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. God bless you.